on a little bit on me. I'm just, let me sort, let me just grab my questions again because I don't want to go off too much. All right. So um, let's do it kind of a little bit chronolo chronolo can you say chronologically. That? Chronologically, um, because the next stage that comes in the trial would be the, uh, what I, we call examination of the witnesses, or sure. I guess we call presenting the case. Do you have any tips for us as to how to do it well, how to do it effectively? Most effective, I think, um, are cases that actually come from documents. Those are the easiest ones to present because you basically put the documents in order and then as you give your testimony, you talk about each document in turn. For example, here's the contract I had for my roof repair. Mm -hmm. Give that to the court, it becomes an exhibit. Right? So when I look at this document, you can see I had a contract with John Smith Roofing. Right? Here they are doing the roof. I took some photos. Here they are. Right? And here's the roof when it was finished. I took a photograph of that too. And I also took photographs of the leaks in the dining room, right? So that lets you tell your story in an orderly way. It also lets you focus on the reason you're there. Wonderful. Right? Instead of starting with, you know, you know, I've, I've known John Smith for 25 years and his, his sons and mine used to play t-ball together. And well, you know, I needed a new roof and I thought to myself, who should I get a new roof from? And I thought about John Smith, whom I've known for 25, you know, that it distracts you if you don't have anything to use as a, as a guidepost. Wow. So the best cases, the easiest cases are ones where you put your documents together and let the documents tell the story, right? If you don't have documents, mm -hmm. you need to sit down before you ever get to court and write out what happened in, without any emotional content, right? You won't be able to testify from those notes, but it will focus you on the order of the story and how the story is to be told, right? So you, you mean you have to memorize this? No. No, 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 you'll know, because you'll know what happened. I lent that, I lent that person $10, and I've asked for it a dozen times. What you're going to write down, right, is here's where I sent him an email, or here's where I phoned him. I, I look at my phone. I phoned him on July 5th. I phoned him again on mm, July 12th, right? So that your story, again, comes out with some kind of structure. But you're saying you're not allowed to take that? Um... I don't think you'd, well, you wouldn't normally be able to testify from the notes. Wow. But you would, you would sort of try to focus yourself on the reason you're there mm. and telling the story in an orderly way, right? Because part of the thing is that the judge will be either writing, right? Mm -hmm. Or typing this all down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you need to tell the story relatively slowly, right? Right to the speed of somebody writing, right? Um, and you need to tell it in an organized way, so that what's on the judge's page is your organized story, right? And I think that's people. Um, I, I'm. It's something that I think litigation lawyers understand but parties often don't understand. Now, that said, I've had some parties, some self-represented litigants who were outstanding. Wow. Who really led a, a great case, you know? <laughs> and I barely had to say or do anything. They just did it. Right. Um, sometimes too, I think if you have a friend who's a paralegal or a friend who's a lawyer or somebody you know who can help, I don't know, maybe pro bono will help in this regard. Right. Um, because I'm always happy to have people come to court 
well organized. I always find that impressive if they're well organized and they tell me a coherent tale. Right? Well, sometimes um, it's not so much, I, I'm, I'm not sure maybe uh, if this is the case in small claims, but uh, so the regular court, um, oftentimes you need to bring in witnesses who are not the parties. Uh, and sometimes um, the, the question of credibility comes yes. into play. Does, does that happen at small claims as well? And, and what are your, or your tips on um, presenting cases or uh, examining witnesses when it comes to these credibility um, issues? Well, credibility is such a tough thing. Yes. It's tough for a number of reasons. The person who goes to court, the person who sues somebody, right. Right, wants to win. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so already <laughs> there's, there's some sort of pull <laughs> towards trying not to give an answer that's going to hurt your case, right? Yes. And I mean, I, that's natural. It's human. It's not, I'm not, I'm not saying that that makes you a terrible, makes somebody a terrible person. It doesn't. It's natural. Right. The trick for any trial, any time you are giving testimony, under oath in a witness box, no matter where, mm -hmm. right? There's only one. No matter what happens, no matter if you think the next words out of your mouth are going to destroy your case, tell the truth. Because the truth will be consistent with the documents. Right. That's number one. The truth will prevent you from breaking into a sweat, <laughs> right? Okay. Which judges notice. <laughs> uh, and the strange part, the reason it's called a trial, right, is because it's a test of whether you'll tell the truth. The, the part that most people do not understand about trials, all right? is that factual things in trials, good fact versus bad fact, is often counterintuitive. What looks like a good fact could be a very bad fact, right? So if you fall into the temptation of mm. trying to turn what you think is a bad fact into a good fact, you could be doing exactly the opposite. Because these things are not linear. They're not straight intuitive. And we see it happen all the time. Litigation lawyers, um, you know, we do go and watch other people's cases. And we right. do go and watch witnesses testify. Uh, yeah. Because we're looking for the person who tries to turn what they think is a bad fact into a good fact. Right. <laughs> you're, you're not in control of that when you're at a trial you know, when, or when you're testifying, you're not in control of that. So the only thing you can do is tell the truth, right? And you'd be surprised. The, um, if I might be permitted a short war story, I gave that lecture to a client who was asked a question by the judge when we were at trial. The judge asked her the question. And I immediately dropped my head and looked down because I didn't want anybody to think I was trying to coach her in any way. Um, and bless her heart, she told the truth. And when she came down off the stand at the break, she said to me, did I mess everything up? I just thought that was the worst answer. Like, but you told me to tell the truth. And I, I did, I told the truth, but it just sounded really bad when I admitted that. Yeah. And I said, no, it, it was exactly the answer you needed to give. Because it was true. Yes, that's really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of um, clients, yeah. um, they, are, um, they, they think that uh, one of the reasons why they're paying high-priced <laughs> lawyers is that they're going to get some kind of coaching yeah. on how to testify in a way that's favorable to their case. And that, that's really interesting. And um, actually, even when I was a, a client, my lawyer's advice was the same. Tell yeah. the truth. Yes. Tell yeah. the truth. Yeah.
it's very, very important. And it's important both for the case right. and for the system, right? The system only works if everybody tells the truth. Mm -hmm.